This is Indie 1023. My name is Alicia Sweeney, and my guest is acclaimed musician Sadie Dupuy, the rock and front woman of Speedy Ortiz and her solo work as Sad 13. The latter project releases a new album, Haunted Painting, September 25th. That's this Friday. It'll be out on our own label, Wax 9. Hi, Sadie. Hi, Alicia. All things considered, how's it going for you on the East Coast? It's going pretty okay. I'm uh, sitting at home in Philly, drinking a, a can of coffee, as I just showed you, and <laughs> you can't really complain about either of those things. I got a little uh, vintage Garfield. Wow, and it is Monday, so it, that's it, quite appropriate. Right? <laughs> well, the album is coming out this Friday. Do you have any plans to celebrate? I, you know, I don't know quite what I could do to celebrate. Um, I think that it's possible my partner is getting some kind of a cake, and um, there's a really nice cemetery park near me that I, maybe I'll go take a walk in. That's that's about my <laughs> as, as big as I can go with celebrating. Right. I would assume in the before times that it would be, you'd probably have an album release show or something. I would probably have been on tour, um, but you know, nice to get to sleep in my own bed on celebration night, so... Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about this new album since it is release week. I I've, I haven't heard the whole record yet, but I'm loving all the singles so far. I, especially Hysterical is like, that's like a jammer for me right now. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, that's like the, the perfect song for, for me. Um, I, I want to talk, was it all written pre-COVID and recorded pre-COVID or during this time? Yeah, it was all done last year. So I finished up mixing in December. Mm -hmm. So just thankfully, I got to safely travel all around the country to record it and safely work with all kinds of different people, engineering and doing backing vocals and things like that. Um, because as we, as we talked about before we started taping, I'm not really doing a whole lot or seeing any people. So um, I'm thankful I got this record done when it was still safe to. Yeah. Since it's, um, since you recorded it pre COVID, I read one of the studios you went to was one that, uh, that Elliot Smith recorded in. Yeah, that was new monkey in Van Nuys. Uh, really, really great studio. Um, not only for its connection to Elliot Smith, obviously, but, um, just a really wonderful space energy, people who work there, cool equipment. Um, that was one of one of the more fun sessions I've been to ever, I think. Nice. And were you just choosing to record? Was it you were just happened to be on tour there? And so you would try to find a studio? Sort of, yeah. Um, one thing that's different about this record than previous records that I've worked on, um, I produced the first Sad 13 record, but then I mixed it and did overdubs with um, a couple of great engineers who are men. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of men in engineering. Um, so some of my best friends are men in engineering. But uh, as anyone who works in audio knows, women and non-binary engineers are pretty drastically outnumbered. I think we comprise like 2% of professional audio workers. Uh, so it felt kind of hypocritical to me that I'm an advocate for women in production and then kept hiring men to mix my records. So it was some combination of studios I'd always wanted to work at including New Monkey, um, and a number of different engineers who are women who I'd wanted to work with for years. So kind of looking at where those people worked and when Speedy had tour dates that would fly me close enough to go work there. Uh, it was sort of some kind of mapping math algorithm where I would say, oh, we have a festival in Chicago. I know this great engineer in Louisville with this amazing analog studio. I can drive down after the festival. So that's kind of how I wound up working in so many different little studios all around the country. And it was exclusively women and non-binary engineers, right? I think it's all women who engineer this record, yeah. That's so inspiring. Anybody that you think should be on our radar that you worked with? Well, I'm certain that Sarah Tedzin's probably already on your radar because she fronts the Bowie. same Illuminati hotties. Yeah. Um, Oh no, that's Alicia. Um, Alicia's in Bali and also oh, an awesome okay. engineer. I have not worked with her, but we are buddies. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah Tedzin's in Illuminati Hotties, who are yes. awesome band, put out a great record this year. Um, Aaron Tonkin's another person I worked with. She's done all kinds of things from 
David Bowie to smaller projects like Pix. Uh, just a really fun, genuine person who has a lot of ideas for how the music business can and should change. Um, so definitely loved working with her. Really everyone I worked with on this was awesome, incredible, would very happily do a full record with them and recommend to anybody out there looking for a producer. Mm -hmm. So Haunted Painting, it's the sophomore album. What's kind of the origin story of it? Okay, well, you know already. I know. Uh, Tell us the origin story <laughs> for those who don't know. <laughs> um, so the, I guess the origin story is I've, I've been doing between Speedy Ortiz and Sat 13 and a book I published a couple years ago. I've just been on the road for, um, it was just about like the past seven years solid. This is by far the longest stretch I've taken off from touring. I think Prior to this, the record was like two months without, you know, extensive travel. Um, so that's just a lot of adrenaline and a lot of time focused on, you know, there's like a customer service element to touring. You're meeting people at the merch table. It's it's very high energy. And then you come home and you're kind of happy but drained. Um, and I think you have to shut off certain parts of your brain and emotions to make that sustainable. So touring so much, um, but also just life things happening. My, my dad passed away. I've had several friends uh, pass away. I've moved all around the place. There's just a lot that you don't necessarily get to process. Um, and I think I started to really do that in earnest and uh, with the help of, you know, talk therapy, which is great. Um, and I just hadn't been interested in working on writing because I think there was a lot of unresolved stuff going on for me mentally that I needed to pay attention to. Um, and I was in, I had done like a, a very short session with Aaron Tonkin who I was just praising um, just to see how it would feel to go back into the studio because it had been a while for me. Um, and the session went great and I went to Seattle for a poetry festival and happened to be in a museum with Robin of Lisa Prank, who I understand is our mutual buddy and hero. Yes. Um, and we saw this amazing painting by Franz Stuck, who's a German expressionist painter. It's a portrait of a dancer named Saharit. Um, it's just like a really cool, creepy, beautiful, but, but very creepy portrait. Um, and I just was really inspired by, by the look of it. Uh, I think in the past, I've often taken titles of songs or even albums from art that I've felt moved by and, and this was um, one of those. So Haunted Painting is just kind of a description of how it looked to me, but it also felt like a cool framing device for a record about kind of coming out of grief and using um, not only music but like introspection as a way to, to move past um, like blockages from from loss and sadness. Yeah. And then you had a, a haunted painting commissioned of you, <laughs> the album cover, right? Yes, Commis I commissioned my mom. Your mom, that is so <laughs> adorable. <laughs> yeah, my mom is a, a really amazing portrait artist, um, and she hadn't done one in a, in a number of years, and sort of, I sort of coaxed her back in. She'd been doing different kind of art and, and painting, um, and I dragged her back in to do this album cover, and I'm really thankful that I did. And I was actually just up visiting her um, last week and we kind of noticed that um, like that the painting does kind of feel a bit haunted. So it's living at your mom's house, this haunted painting of you? Yeah, and it's bigger than it looks from the album cover. It's like quite a bit bigger than my face. So <laughs> I was, um, if you catch its eyes at night, it's a little, it's a little eerie, especially when it's modeled after your own face. And you're, there's ghost imagery on this album or ghost metaphors on this album. Now you're a believer in ghosts, right? Oh, a hundred percent. So yeah, tell got, me about, yeah. You live in the city with the most haunted airport. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what goes on below it or anything. Oh, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about what oh, goes yeah. on below it. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do believe in ghosts. I like creepy things. Have I ever what? Have you ever felt any presence or anything at DIA? I have not, but I have taken selfies with all of the 
um, supposedly haunted portraits and uh, Bl Blucifer, Blucifer. I don't believe yes. that's the real name of the horse, but yeah, that really does have a macabre story connected to it. Oh, totally! Didn't it, it didn't fall on and and kill the it killed the sculptor. Art. Yeah, that's terrible. Totally, it's a beautiful piece. It is. It is very iconic to coming in and out of Denton out of the airport for sure. Okay, so you do believe in haunted things. There's this ghost imagery, and so it, that's just part of you. So that's how it ends up being in your work, I guess, right? Yeah, I think that the ghosty stuff has kind of consistently showed up um, in the Speedy Ortiz and even the previous Sad 13 record. But I think with knowing that the record would be called Haunted Painting and have this kind of backstory, um, I kind of dove further into it than I have in the past, which was fun for me. Mm-hmm. You talked about themes like um, grief and mental health for this album, but there's also politics and, and sexism in the music industry. Like all of that, like really resonated with me. And I'm wondering, like, I'm an elder millennial and I connect with your music, but I'm, I hope that there's like this young group of Gen Zers, especially like young women that can listen to your songs and find wisdom and power in it. Do you know, do you have a lot of younger fans or? Um, I think, I mean, it's hard to tell from this album because I haven't been on tour yet. Yeah. Something that I've always really appreciated about both the Speedy Ortiz and the Sad 13 Project is that I think in terms of gender and age, our fans are kind of all over the map. Um, one of my favorite things to see is when we do an all ages show and there's like, tons of kids and I get to talk to them after at Little the merch table or kids who are there with their parents and the parents tell me like they've just started drum lessons. Um, that's really gratifying. But I also love to see, you know, fans who are my parents age and older. Um, I feel like we kind of run the gamut and that feels, I, I feel cool about that. Right. So you produced it, you played nearly all the instruments on the album. Was this the first time that you took on all of those duties? I know you said you produced the other Sad 13 record. Yeah, um, it was a similar deal on the last record, but the, the big difference was I basically made this record twice because I did a version of everything at home, um, which is how I did the first Sad 13 record. And then on this one, I redid it all in studio so that it would be bigger hi-fi, cool old instruments, um, rare gear, stuff like that. So that that was sort of the big difference. Like mm -hmm. on the first record, I could kind of just go into a rabbit hole at home for a couple days and the song was produced and done. Um, I still did that on this record and then had to go into the studio for a couple more days to, to redo it all. I, I mentioned I haven't listened to the whole album yet just because I didn't receive an advanced copy. What um, are they doing? I know. This I'll so get you in okay. today. <laughs> Please. Um, but I hear that Meryl Garbus from Tune Yards is on it. Uh, Roberto from El Lado Negro. Satan yeah. From Deer Hoof. Like, what are, what are some of the roles that they take on on this record? They're all um, vocalists. So in the case of Satomi, for example, I had a song where... Like it's it's pain. when I send you audio for this interview, it will be like painful for me because I cannot stand my speaking voice. Um, so yeah. there's like a speech part on one of the songs, and I was like, who do I know with a great speaking voice? Satomi. So I sent it to her, and she kind of just she. It's funny. She like almost does an impression of my speaking voice on it, uh, which is great and better than my own. Um, so if, if anyone ever does an animation of me and you need to hire a voice actor, uh, Satomi Matsuzaki is my, my casting recommendation. Um, in the case of Meryl Garbus, I did that song at Tiny Telephone, which is a studio that she's worked at a lot. And I actually went there specifically because of projects she's worked on. So I had this, that, she's on, um, Ghost of a Good Time. And there's a, a backing vocal on there that's like, ooh -ah, ooh -ah. It just kind of sounded like tune yards to me. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So I was like, "Hey, would you wanna would you wanna do this instead of me?" And the answer was yes. Um, Roberto's on a song where I just knew, even before I recorded a note of it, I was just like, "It needs a voice like his uh, as like a textural element." And thankfully, he he was happy to be on it. So yeah, just lucky to have um, some great musicians with great voices who were happy to send me their vocals to add in. That's cool. What about, do you have a favorite lyric on, on the album? 
Um, I, I always favorite child, but I know I always like am proud of the really silly references that I don't know if people always pick up on. Um, there's a Buster Rhymes reference somewhere in WTD that I'm proud of. There's a teenage dirtbag reference in one of the songs that I'm proud of. So the ones that come to mind for me are always like the, like where I feel like I'm a rap lyricist and I got in like a very slant reference and I hope that someone picks up on it. Oh, I love that. I got to go back and like now find that in What's the Drama. Yeah, I find it. I'll be so psyched if you do. Okay, cool. Let's talk music videos. They're so good. Your lyrics just come into life in these music videos. Um, there's Hysterical and Oops and Ghost of a Good Time. Do you have a favorite of the videos so far? They all came out so great. And I was lucky to work with really cool directors on all three of them. I, I think that the Hysterical video is my favorite. Um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, they're all, I, I love them all and I, I didn't direct them. So I get to say that without sounding like a narcissist, but um, the hysterical video is especially fun for me because I'm not used to doing videos in, in quarantine. The other ones we did are just me completely alone, obviously working with, you know, anywhere from like one to two people in the room, but at a far social distance. And the hysterical video we did as an homage to the sort of webcam movie Unfriended, yeah. um, which is one of my favorite movies. But it meant that I got to have other actors be part of it. Um, Mitra and Demi and Jamie are all some of my favorite comedians. And it was just nice to get to play off some other people rather than just like solely alone in a room. So I think that is my favorite because even though it was done remotely, obviously, um, it's just nice to get to work with other people. Yeah, I was wondering because I think like Oops was recorded on Zoom. I think I read that like. Yeah, the, the director was working over Zoom. Um, how do you pump yourself up, you know, when it is recorded like that? It's just a weird, it's a weird and different experience. Um, and certainly things move a lot slower than they would if everyone could just be in the room together and there's a sort of an adjustment of, of pacing that um, thankfully I had already kind of gotten used to having done the ghost video first with the director just occupying every single role of the movie, um, the movie music video, you know what I mean? It feels like a movie to me because it took so long. Um, so I think that's just going to be an adjustment that I don't know how it works in, in film and TV. I know that a lot of sets have shut down because it's just not safe to have more than a couple people around each other who've all been tested. Um, but it was still really fun, even though, you know, kind of a learning experience to to do stuff in, in these times. Yeah. I saw you mention on Twitter this morning you might release another music video before the end. Yeah, there's a, there'll be another video out this week. But it's, um, it's stop motion. I'm not, I don't appear in it, which is even better. Super cool, man. <laughs> I, your music videos are perfect. And it like, and I think it really like, um, gives people a glimpse into your personality and like that you are into like this horror -y kind of side of things and like horror comedy and such. I just love it. Um, what's, what's some of your, what was your first favorite horror film? Or do you remember what the first scary thing was that you watched? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely grew up watching a lot of horror comedy classics. I think Beetlejuice was one of my favorite movies growing up. Best, yeah. um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie, not the TV show, mm -hmm. um, was one something I just like rented over and over again. Even like Little Shop of Horrors or um, or Twilight Zone stuff like that was kind of what I grew up watching. Um, the first like slasher movie I can remember seeing was like. Uh, I think it was like Freddy versus Jason, um, which, you know, I was like eight years old or something when it came out. So I got immune to the slasher gore pretty young. Um, but I still love, I love stuff along those lines. My favorite movies are the Scream movies. Mm -hmm. um, so I like horror movies, but I like them when they're sort of self-referential, silly, campy, that kind of thing. And I feel like even before this album, I've kind of tried to do music videos in that vein. Mm -hmm. Aren't they working on a new Scream movie or isn't? Mm -hmm. 
Are yeah, they just announced Nev Campbell's going to be in it. Yes, I saw that. You have to get on the soundtrack or something. Like, you have no. to get or something. I would love my – let's put it out there into the universe. My yep. my fantasy is to be on a Scream soundtrack. Um, Scream 2 soundtrack in particular is a favorite, and I've even covered the song that Liz Fair wrote for it that did not make it to the soundtrack. It's something that Speedy did a cover of uh, and actually performed it with Liz on tour. So – I feel like I've I've set myself up to be on the Scream Five soundtrack, and um, whoever is in charge, call me. We're making this happen. We'll start a whole Twitter campaign. I, you know what? I'm in. I I am home more than I used to be, and I'm ready to take on a, a Twitter campaign. Yes. So you write across a couple mediums. You've got Speedy. You're um, you're a writer. You're published writer with Mouthguard, your book of poetry. So give me an update. What's going on with Speedy Ortiz right now? Kind of nothing. I mean, that's not to say there won't be stuff going on, yeah. but I really intended to kind of do this record and have that be my, you know, little break from, from doing Speedy stuff. Um, and since I'm not getting to tour this record, I'm kind of, and obviously we can't all hang out and rehearse and, and do things as a full band. I probably will do it more Sad 13 stuff mm -hmm. while we're still in pandemic world. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and no, no plans right now other than like, th there will be more speedy stuff. That's not, I'm not done with that project. But um, for now, I don't see a good way to make it happen. Yeah, I get it. How about with your writing? What's going on there? Uh, I have another book done manuscript so um kind of just beginning very tepidly to start sending that to to some friends for notes but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I do have another manuscript done well mazel tov to that that's pretty amazing. thank you yeah you seem like i just don't un well i mean i do understand you're an ambitious person so you find time you make time to do all these things but you've got this new merch coming out alongside Haunted Painting. Like you're offering up tea, hazelnut spread, hot sauce. The, actually, when I we had to pause in the middle of this interview so I could get the, the door, it was a bunch of chocolate from the hazelnut spread people that <laughs> <laughs> came. So that's what you're eating as soon as we're done. Honestly, yes. <laughs> what's been your what's been your favorite thing that you've created? Um, oh, I also love the little play on words, the Polter guys, pizza. Thank you. That that came from Andrew Shearer, who's one of the people who worked on the the hysterical music video. Um, I do really like that that merch item. I feel like yeah. it's so niche. Uh, you'd have to have like really paid attention to the music video to get it, but it's funny. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so clever. I love that play on words. Um, all right. Well, let's talk a little COVID and and uh, kind of these times of COVID and what you've been doing, like losing your employment as a touring musician, you've been a real vocal advocate. I don't know, maybe a spokesperson for UMAW, the Union of Musicians and Allied Workers. And, and that yeah. emerged during this time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started doing UMA, um, I think in, in early April it went public. Um, that kind of arose from a group of people who've worked on some other campaigns together, um, one of which was No Music for Ice, which I was part of as well, uh, that kind of launched about a year ago in asking musicians to say no to work, exclusive work with Amazon um, while they continue to power the tech infrastructure for ICE. Um, ICE is basically able to deport people because of Amazon's tech. So uh, that's kind of the line we drew there. And a lot of people who worked on that campaign, as well as a couple of others, um, came together to do UMA. And it's been, what, six months now? Um, we have meetings once a week. We have a number of different subcommittees doing advocacy work, everything from fairer pay for musicians on streaming services to what we can envision venues looking like when they are able to reopen to combating racism in classical music. Um, there's some very specific subcommittees and then some that are more broad in general, but all are kind of working to build a fairer and more inclusive future for music workers whenever we're able to resume normal work. So it's been um, a nice thing to be part of and nice to hear 
from so many musicians I wasn't familiar with in the past who have really great ideas for what our future can look like. And I, I'm really thankful to be involved in a couple different subcommittees there. That's super cool. Um, we have an election coming up soon, mm -hmm. 40 some days. I think last presidential election, if I remember, I remember that sad 13 video about consent that, uh, yeah. that put out like shortly after that election, um, um, right after Slugger, your debut sad 13 record came out and you were encouraging people to vote back then. Um, anything you want to mention about this moment or? Um, I will be voting for Joe Biden. I am a socialist and uh, definitely very important to be voting for your local uh, Senate races, local small elections as well. Um, I'm psyched that in Philly, we were able to elect a number of kind of uh, working families, socialist candidates uh, to smaller positions and I'm, I'm I'm not as on top of what's happening in Colorado, but um, yeah, obviously I'm encouraging everyone to vote and continue to do so. And it's pretty crucial that we vote Trump out. Um, the The last record did come out like days after the, the 2016 presidential election. And part of why this one's out in September is I was like, I would love for it to be out before I have Hopefully we have great news in November and I'm going to remain optimistic, but I just don't even want a chance having to promote music when uh, reeling from political misery. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my <laughs> lukewarm <laughs> speech. <laughs> Back to Scream Part 5. I've, yes. I've been thinking and ruminating over the last few minutes in, in a little side piece of my brain how you could be a part of the movie. Maybe you could be like playing at a coffee shop or maybe you could be like a cool music teacher at like a high, the high school. I'm into that. Or something like- I just want to play the prom scene. I feel like yeah, there haven't like, been enough prom scenes in Scream. Maybe yeah. Scream 5 is time. Yeah, maybe it needs to take place all at the, at the high school and everything. Yeah, yeah, you're playing the prom. That's how we're doing it. And- you you probably want to get killed, right? So you can have a cool death scene. I'd be I'd be down to be killed, or maybe I can, you know, play the scream version of you, and I'm like the, you know, local public radio DJ, yes. and I get killed on air. Yes, I love. I actually I love radio horror. Um, or maybe we both are in it, and I'm like doing it in studio. Ghostface comes in, and takes us all out. Yes. Okay. We we're making this happen. Like you said, you got time for Twitter. I got time for Twitter. We're petition to the West Craven Estate. Yes, we've got we've got a scene for you. <laughs> we've already start. We've already written it for you. So, <laughs> oh, Sadie, it's been super. On certain cool. times, we got to branch out into new jobs like screenwriting. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We got to diversify even more. Um, Haunted Painting, it's coming out this Friday, sophomore record, on your own label, Wax9, and thank you for hanging out and chatting for a few. Yeah, this was really fun. It was. It's... And I'll get the record, I'll make sure the record gets over to you. Okay, good. I'm excited to, to listen to the whole thing. I want to know the order of how the songs go. <laughs> like, I'm like a purist when it comes to like the full length album. Like I want to hear the flow. Weirdly, like all the singles are in a row on this one. And I've never done that before. It wasn't like I tried to stack, like the order was set before I picked singles. But uh, yeah. It's some ghost. <laughs> You'll know a bunch of them in a row. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I'm excited to listen to it. It'll be a, uh, a ghost of a good time. Oh. <laughs> well, Sadie, thank you so much and um, best wishes over the next few months um, getting through the rest of the pandemic and celebrating the new album and everything. Thanks, Alicia. It was great talking to you. Yeah, you too. Hey, so I'm coming back a few hours after I recorded the interview you just watched and Sad 13 was able to record a song for us. So enjoy. Hey, this is Sadie from Sad 13. I'm going to play a new song for you called Ruby Wand. It's from my new album, Haunted Painting, out September 25th on Wax 9. And thank you so much to Indie 1023 for inviting me here to my own basement to play this session.
Diagnosed with OCD today Somebody take my metal away I just dive into my skin Looking for proof I'm okay It's the first time someone has slept with past Half a decade since we spoke last I can't stop searching for his name As if I wouldn't do things the same Magic hour burning by my side I make the bed, it's somewhere to lie Holding a ruby in my hand One thing in my command I need control Just afloat, but treading 